so this, uh, so we essentially for this for this session, we have uh, three talks that are all revolving around privacy and security uh, aspects of software and systems. And so our first presenter is Brian Cunningham. Um, he's the executive director of the UCI Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute. So this is an institute that uh, ha that is actually a relatively new institute. It's, it's on a second year of operation. Um, it is an interesting institute because it looks at security from, uh, at, in terms of an interdisciplinary, it has an interdisciplinary perspective to security, so it looks at it from a legal perspective, policy perspective, but also technology perspective, so it involves faculty from um, different uh, schools uh, at UCI, and it's a UCI um, campus-wide initiative. Um, and so ISR has had a very, um, Good collaborations with the institute um, over the past year or two, and so it's uh, my pleasure to have Brian here, and we look forward to hear more about what he has to say. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, everybody, for indulging what will undoubtedly be the least technical presentation of the day. So just think of it as a way to pass a little time after lunch before you get back to something you really care about. Uh, no, actually, I'm your lawyer. I'm here to help you. <laughs> Only one of those things is true. The uh, California bar makes us put this disclaimer on all of our slides. It's not legal advice, you can't follow it because I'm not employed by the university as a lawyer and I don't represent any of you. So if anyone's thinking of going out and launching a cyber attack tonight, you can't use my advice <laughs> to uh, stay out of jail. But I'm hoping, uh, on the helping you front, somewhat more seriously, I'm hoping I can at least put an issue out there on the table that will be of interest to some of you and will be something that you'll be paying attention to a little bit more in the future. Since this is the first uh, real cybersecurity presentation of the day, I think, and since this is not a cybersecurity conference, I just thought it'd be useful to take a minute, and I'm going to be very careful of everyone's time, to reflect on where we've come in the last 10 years in cybersecurity, just by way of one anecdote. In 2005, <coughs> I was the principal co-author of a chapter in this uh, textbook on uh, information security. And by the way, still available on Amazon. Um, and uh, the, the reason I mention it is because we had a hypothetical scenario at the beginning of the chapter where President Hillary Clinton, who we had coming into office in 2009, so we were only uh, eight years and 34 electoral votes off in our prediction, <laughs> um, she was faced with an uh, escalating cyber attack which could have been uh, nothing, it could have been kids in the basement, could have been a government, and how does she deal with that kind of issue and sorting through the fog of war and all that. And it, it involved a, an attack through cyberspace on the power grid. And I had two co-authors on that chapter, and we were so unable to agree about whether or not it would be possible any time in the foreseeable future for an attacker to go through cyberspace and affect the physical world that we had to drop a footnote in the book saying we don't agree whether this could ever happen. Well now, <laughs> 11 years later, you have Stuxnet, you have the attacks on the Ukrainian power grid, you have San Francisco transportation system being hijacked, you have uh, ransomware all over the place, botnet attacks, so anyway, we've come a long way in uh, what's the possible. So what I want to talk about today uh, briefly is the issue of attribution. What is attribution? Well, put simply, it's just who done it. Uh, as a former economic espionage prosecutor uh, and policy person, uh, we had to worry all the time, of course, about uh, who actually was involved in conducting the attack. And that sounds maybe simple, but it's actually not. There's three types of attribution. One is, can you attribute a particular action to a machine? to a particular MAC address or, or another way of identifying a machine. But that, from the legal standpoint, doesn't actually get you very far. Because then you need to be able to prove whose fingers were on the keyboard of the machine or who launched the automated software that's taking the action, et cetera. And even that uh, is not necessarily the end of the question because then you need to determine who's the responsible party, who <coughs> is uh, ordering or paying or directing uh, or in some way, sometimes cheating uh, the, the agent at the keyboard into doing what they did. And why, why do we care? I'm going to talk very briefly about that. One of the main reasons why we care about attribution, meaning the ability to prove who your attacker was, is for deterrence. So 
fear of penalties, fear of legal action, fear of responsive action or retaliation on the part of a government can deter some adversaries from conducting some of the worst activities in cyberspace. However, that kind of deterrence can only be effective if the responsible party can not only be identified, but in a lot of cases actually publicly proven. So if uh, the United States wants to take uh, uh, action in cyberspace against Russia or North Korea in response to some action. Uh, we can entirely go it alone, but we're a lot more likely to be able to get other governments to agree with us and support our actions if we can prove, as President Kennedy did when he took the U-2 pictures of the Cuban Missile uh, uh, installation to the UN, if we can publicly prove uh, and convince the world of who actually did the attack. Okay, why is this such a difficult problem? Uh, this has been flagged by senior U.S. government <coughs> officials for a number of years as a major problem. Uh, as the DNI said back in 2010, we need to locate the source of attacks with a trail of evidence, lawyers, evidence. So I feel one of the few things I feel qualified to talk about uh, up here um, to support our various options. Uh, and as many experts have said, the attribution problem is in some ways the hardest problem in all of cybersecurity, one of the hardest problems, at least on the legal and policy side. Uh, how, how, do we, how is attribution typically done? Well, there's a, a number of methodologies that are used. Um, historically, technical forensics has been one of the major ways. So if you can get your hands on a device or a machine, or if you can follow things like IP addresses, you can uh, make some judgments there, although things like IP addresses are easily spooked and frequently spooked. And, susceptible to what we in the intelligence business used to call false flag attacks, uh, one party essentially leaving an evidentiary trail trying to uh, convict another party. Uh, one of the most common ways nowadays is through uh, matching of code and or methodology. So one of the ways the U.S. government tried to suggest that uh, Russia was behind the attacks, uh, hacks around our election was to say, well, here's some code that was used to attack the Ukrainian artillery control system. The only people that would want to do that would be the Russians. It's the same code, therefore, it's the Russians. There are obviously some logical problems with that uh, explanation, not the least of which is that code was out in the wild and could have been used by anyone, uh, anyone with the right expertise. But nonetheless, that's the way it's typically done. Um, you know, obviously, you look at who benefits from a particular attack. You can look at uh, uh, intercepts of communications if you're the government, human intelligence sources, and try to draw some facts from those. Rarely will there ever be a single smoking gun, and a lot of uh, situations are very, very murky, and there's also a credibility problem sometimes. If our government's trying to prove another government did something, uh, we're not always be, uh, believed and, and relied upon by the rest of the world. And usually, no single factor is enough to make an attribution case. There has to be a combination of factors. Well, in the intelligence business, we have all source intelligence, combining lots of different pieces of information together. Uh, I'm going to skip through this uh, in the interest of time. This is a, actually quite a good article by former Assistant Attorney General for National Security laying out some of the ways that the government does attribution. Um, a lot of these techniques, compelled search and seizure, uh, be forcing the internet service providers to turn over records are things that typically a private sector party is not going to have available to them. Uh, I think this is hopefully self-explanatory why I look at this problem of attribution. One reason is that it uh, tends to cross into many, many verticals, uh, whether you're a government, as I've talked about, trying to prove, whether you're a U.S. government trying to prove North Korea attacked Sony, or China stole intellectual property, or Russia hacked our elections. Um, you need to be able to prove who did it. If you're a private party, you often need to be able to do that for lots of your le criminal and civil le uh, legal options. And on the grandest scale, one reason why we need to be able to get this right is attribution mistakes can lead to an actual kinetic war, shooting war. All major governments, including the United States, have taken the position that if there's a sufficiently severe cyber attack, we reserve the right to respond with kinetic force, missiles, bombs, troops. The Russians have even said they reserve the right to respond with nuclear weapons to a cyber attack under certain circumstances. And NATO just this week announced that a sufficiently severe cyber attack on infrastructure would trigger the right to self-defense and require other NATO countries to defend 
the country attack. So the stakes are high. Sir. Will the concept of war included legally include blockade, naval blockade? Is there an extension, legal extension, to the survey space of that concept that so far has not been uh, legally formalized in, in treaties, but basically considers it to be analog? Yeah, I'm going <coughs> to get back to get to that in a okay. little bit more in a second. But the, the the analogies that have been drawn from the physical world to the cyber world, particularly in international law, are still wide open. It's not clear at all. But okay. but in theory, yeah, if there was a in fact a cyber blockade, suppose we decided to shut off all cyber emissions out of, out of North Korea, that could be considered an act of war if we didn't have sufficient provocation. And that's why it's so important to start to try to have some understood international norms because if nobody knows what the rules are then we're much like more likely to make a mistake North Korea does something that they don't think is an act of war but we do and we respond okay why do private sector <coughs> companies by the way uh, how many folks here are practitioners okay researchers okay lawyers <laughs> Good, I can make all this stuff up. Okay. This gentleman right here will be able to hold me accountable. Um, so I wanted to switch now from the government context into something that's much more relevant to practitioners. In many cases, after you respond to an attack by stopping the bleeding, by doing your mitigation, by figuring out how deep into your systems the penetrations were, by figuring out if you have persistent exfiltration of data, once your lawyers get involved, even if uh, CISOs oftentimes don't care as much about attribution, the lawyers will. Why? Well, because in many cases, in order to get additional help uh, to, to deal with attacks, you have to uh, be able to show some information that, that leads to attribution. For example, if you want to get the government's cooperation, especially if you, want, if you believe it's a, a government that attacked you, or if you need to take down botnets, for example, uh, if you want to take, if you want to sue someone for economic espionage, if you want to go to the U.S. Attorney and get a criminal prosecution, and in I think the next five to ten years, if you want to be able to exercise new legal authorities for active defense, uh, which is a whole multi-hour topic which we don't have time for, um, then you're going to be able to have to be able to some degree do it attribution. However, the state of the art in this area is exceedingly weak, at least the state of the art in terms of what is in the non-classified, uh, non-governmental realm. If you recall when the, uh, our government initially tried to show that the Russians were behind some of the hacks around the U.S. election, they initially res relied almost entirely <coughs> on analysis from private cybersecurity firms. Um, the declassified assessment has almost no attribution information. And my favorite, the DHS FBI report actually has a disclaimer on it. It's the only time, I was an intelligence officer for 15 years, I've almost never seen a disclaimer. So right on the document that the FBI and DHS published attempting to show that the Russians were behind the hacks, there's a disclaimer which says they don't provide any warranties of any kind regarding any information contained in this document. So that inspires a lot of confidence. So, Don, can I ask you a question? Yeah. The disclaimer so that somebody else can go back and sue the U.S. government for what they said, is that recently? Yes, that's, that's probably why the lawyers put it on there. But considering that the U.S. government has sovereign immunity from actually being successfully sued, how bad did that information have to be if they felt it necessary to put that disclaimer on there? I wasn't in the government when it happened. I'm just speculating. Uh, so in the, in the legal terms, um, what we're looking at and what we have, we're researching as part of our institute is what should be the appropriate standards of proof and various contexts of attribution. These are going to be different based on the context. So the level and type of information you might show if you want to go to the United Nations and get sanctions is going to be different than if you're in a criminal prosecution, which will be different than if you're in a civil case. But that's what we, that's what we decided to look at as one of our initial research projects in the area of attribution because we think that a lot of the more substantive technical research depends in part on being able to know what the standards are that you're trying to prove against. Also because I have a lot of lawyers that are involved in my effort and we didn't need to raise any research money to do this particular initial project. So 
what we're trying to do is develop and propose standards of proof in these various contexts where uh, this, is, this is, uh, effort's well underway. We're looking at all the publicly available materials. We're going to uh, interview practitioners. Uh, we're going to try to synthesize across the publicly available legal cases and other documentation uh, and information uh, what combination of factors have been most persuasive in the international context and then in the federal, <coughs> criminal, and civil law context and then propose some model standards of proof uh, that hopefully eventually we can get some consensus around. So under international law, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but there has to be an armed conflict underway. There has to be a provable nexus between the cyber attack at issue and the armed conflict. Unfortunately, as I mentioned a minute ago, there's no agreed upon standards of proof for what's enough to, to constitute that. There's a significant amount of more development of the law in the federal prosecution <coughs> context, the one I used to work in. Obviously, if you've watched TV, you know that the two key standards in prosecutions are one, is there probable cause uh, to believe a crime has been committed? And then to get a conviction, you need to prove uh, proof uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, that a particular individual is responsible. You can't indict and convict a machine. You have to be able to prove that a person did it. Um, again, there's no real established legal standard for what uh, meets this test. But we've started to draw some conclusions from our initial research. Uh, a lot of the case law around this to, comes from botnet takedowns. So a lot of people don't know this, but private companies working with the U.S. government um, have in many cases gone to a U.S. federal judge and got an order that allows them to go into machines, even thousands of machines they don't know the identity of, and take down botnets, take, take them off the machines, uh, go in and take out the command and control servers. And the key lesson from these cases is that the key thing you need is you need to be able to show uh, who is in control of these command and control botnet servers. And this has happened, this has been successfully done uh, a number of times now by private companies working with the government, but it often requires you to be able to go to other countries and get their legal authorities to compel ISPs and other service providers to give you information, which private parties uh, generally don't have. This is a, a chart, we're going to post these slides, uh, it's a chart that shows a lot of the most persuasive evidence in the recent successful prosecutions. Again, the takeaway is um, all of these cases that have been successful required information that typically only government law enforcement or intelligence agencies working with their foreign counterparts can get. So that initial takeaway um, has led us to, at the Institute, look for the ability to assemble uh, multidisciplinary team of researchers and get some funding to look at whether there can be a more holistic approach or all sciences approach to attribution so that you don't have to, especially if you're a private sector actor, uh, rely on information that only governments can get. So is there a role for psychologists to look at the behavior of individual hackers? Is there a role for cultural anthropologists to look at the behavior of these uh, uh, persistent automated persistent threat groups and how their hierarchies are or organized. Is there a role for cryptographers and linguists? Can you develop, in effect, uh, reliable uh, fingerprints or signatures of attackers that could take the place of some of this purely technical or forensic work? So that's going to be the next phase of our work once we uh, complete the legal review. So that's the current state of the law. Um, <laughs> But we're forging ahead to try to make some progress on that. And I'm told by Sam I'm out of time. And since I'm the one of the ones with the big time constraints, so I'm going to definitely honor that. Uh, I, our, our institute is governed uh, by six deans at the university. And in uh, 28 minutes, I have a meeting with three of them. So uh, hopefully, uh, this has at least been a good introduction to the topic. And it's something that you'll maybe pay attention to and care about a little bit, even if you didn't uh, before. So I could probably take one or two questions, if you have any. Uh, let's go over here and then over here. Yeah. So, so um, previously, there was a um, you put down that we don't think this could happen, so I'm not sure about it. Is there something now that you don't think that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would I would I would never say never. Now, I mean, the, the big one of the big issues in the next ten years is going to be. The gov I think the government is going to start to grant a lot more authorities to private companies to do self-help. 
so-called hacking back and active defense. Right now, most companies, and I had a lot of clients in the private sector before I came here, don't want this authority because even if they can do it, they don't want to get themselves on the radar screen of Russia or China as a bigger target. But I think as the government proves less able to defend our companies, our companies are going to start doing more of that. So I wouldn't say never could happen, but uh, 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 it's on the way. Sir? One, one aspect is, are we looking in the defense of using basically the same techniques with the cryptographers, linguists, that were used in the espionage, if you will, to capture the the signal flow. Yeah, I think they are now doing it the other way around. Instead of offense, we're doing it the defense, but it's the legal aspect from standpoint of the government law enforcement. And with that also the other aspect that touches on the company are private companies required now to report all the breaches? Or is it still voluntary? So uh, I'm going to be at the reception. Uh, okay. Talk more about the first okay. question with you there. On the second one, yeah, that's a really important point. Um, there's a lot of potential legal liability for getting these kind of decisions wrong. And uh, companies, particularly publicly traded companies, now are required to report breaches and as much information about them as they can. Thank you. Thanks.